if you have like something in your cells, like let's just say it's colonized in your kidneys or your liver or whatever, or your lungs, and then you have another infection that comes into your body, like the flu or whatever, these bacteria are going to be afraid of this virus. Let's say, for instance, the virus is more pathogenic and they're going to flee or try to get away from it. So they burrow down deeper. We get flare ups. Do you have an autoimmune condition and you have tried desperately to try to make sense of this? Perhaps you've been on medication and you're trying to address fully and it's just not working, or you have an undiagnosed autoimmune condition. Perhaps you've gone to the doctor. They've said, this is autoimmune in nature, but we have no idea what this is. So just come back to me when it's worse. Today's episode is 100% for you. Our guest today is Elizabeth Harris, who's the author of What's Wrong With My Child and America is Infected. Elizabeth is a science-minded business owner with more than two decades of experience in the field of wellness. For over two decades, Elizabeth has owned La Bella a Famosa Spa, a highly successful facial and body contouring spa in, in the Nashville area. She has a background in biology and chemistry that helped her develop her own skincare line and cellulite reduction device. She also has training in nutrition, physical fitness, and cardiac rehab from the American College of Sports Medicine. Elizabeth's education, life experience, drive, and entrepreneurial spirit proved to be the very thing that saved the life of both herself and her son after they were diagnosed with a rare and very serious autoimmune disease. Today, Elizabeth uses her experience and her expert wellness team to help others at What's Wrong Wellness. This is an awesome episode. It's probably going to blow your mind in a couple of areas and be challenging to kind of wrap your head around. This is work that I've been pretty dedicated to over the last two years, starting to look at root causes, the proper order of operations to take a body through, and really start asking the question, why is this happening and what is at the root? So without further ado, let's get to today's interview. Hey, my name is Leanne Vogel. I'm fascinated with helping women navigate how to eat, move, and care for their bodies using a low-carb diet. I'm a small town holistic nutritionist turned three-time international best-selling author turned functional medicine practitioner offering telemedicine services around the globe to women looking to better their health and stop second-guessing themselves. I'm here to teach you how to wade through the wellness noise to get to the good stuff that'll help you achieve your goals. We're supporting your low-carb life beyond the if it fits your macros conversation hormones, emotions, relationship to your body, workouts, letdowns, motivation, blood work, detoxing, metabolism. I'm providing the tools to put your motivation into action. Think of it like quality time with your bestie mixed with a little med school so you're empowered at your next doctor visit. Get ready to be challenged and encouraged while you learn about your body and how to care for it better. This is the Keto Diet Podcast. Hey, Elizabeth. How are you? I'm great, Leanne. How are you this morning? I am so good. I love when Southern people say my name. It is literally the (laughs) cutest thing. I just, it's so awesome. It's so awesome. I am so thrilled to have you on the show today. We're going to be talking about autoimmunity and I'm sure a whole bunch of other things. How did you get going in this work? Like what, what was the thing that kind of pushed you over the edge that really got you passionate about this topic? Well, interestingly enough, I have a degree in biology and a minor in chemistry, and then I did go on to study in sports medicine at the American College of of Sports Medicine in Texas, and I was a personal trainer. I had a cardiac rehab program and a weight loss counselor. That was my, my first career, and so I segued into the spa industry from that, and so I'm very well versed in fitness and weight loss and nutritional theories. And I've kept up with that through the years. But what I found was that, you know, no matter what happens, it's like there is a certain population of people that just wouldn't lose the weight like the other percentage of the population. And I just came to believe that they weren't always lying to me. You know, I would I would manage their weight loss program, meet them at the gym at six in the morning, watch them work out. And when you actually run the numbers 
and the calories and the physical activity they were doing, it'd be literally like, okay, you've got to be eating 6,000 calories a day to maintain this weight. Let's, let's go through that. And so the math just wasn't, it just wasn't balancing for me. And I was just started thinking at that point in time, I guess it was 20 years ago, there's got to be something else. This can't just be like a straight math problem <laughs> because it's what we were taught. That's what we were told. And I just started having a real ethical issue with shaming the population. It just really, I didn't like it. I didn't, you know, we were taught, okay, well then they have to be lying. And I'm just like, I just don't think that's the case. I think there's something else. And so at that point in time, the physician that was over our program, he brought in this cellulite reduction device called Endermology Synergy. And I started using that and found that the skin tightening did work, but clients were losing inches. And I thought the clients were just much more motivated when they had something externally to help and support them. And they did the exercise and all that. So I diverged into the spa world and really dove into the business piece and the entrepreneurship. I, I embraced that, developing my own cellulite device eventually, consulting around the world. And I had a very amazing career. I enjoyed it tremendously. World, I mean, I go to Canada and install a device and go here and train in, in Vegas. Or, but one day when my son, I had four kids, was about, had just turned 11, he came down with a strep infection, like strep throat. I took him to the doctor and he put him on antibiotics. And then about two weeks after that, he came down with some very bizarre symptoms. Like I didn't recognize them at the time because I didn't even know what OCD was. <laughs> but now I know he was walking back and forth across the transition strip between the kitchen and the living room, 27 times back and forth. He explains to me now it's because he had to get his left foot just right. Buttoning his shirt up and down, up and down, wanting me to boil his toothbrush to get to like 108 degrees. And I'm like, how did you even arrive at that number? How did you know this? <laughs> and it just escalated and got worse over the next several days until the third day he was crouched behind the chair, felt like bugs were crawling on him, pupils huge. And I had continuously called the pediatrician, like there's something really wrong. And they're like, oh, he's just whatever. So the third day I called, I'm like, there's something wrong. And it was a different physician on call. And he recognized it and said, this sounds like an acute onset of pandas. Take them to the Vanderbilt emergency room. So I did. And I quickly looked it up. There was only one like page on it, one site about it. And it just was talking about molecular mimicry, similar to rheumatic fever. And since I had a biology degree, I immediately recognized the fact that if there are antibodies attacking the heart in rheumatic fever as a result of a group A strep infection, that this could mean there are antibodies attacking his brain. And of course, I was very fearful. But when I get to Vanderbilt, they're not acting as you would think they should or as was appropriate. It was very odd. There's teams of people coming in. And when I first check in, I'm thinking that they all know what this is. Since it was mentioned by this pediatrician, I was told to go there. They don't know what this is. <laughs> I mean, the neurologist came in. But remember, as a mom who owned a spa, I never really went to the doctor. Like, I took the kids to the doctor, but I didn't know those different teams. They all have white coats on. So neurology comes in, another team, another team. And you're talking to all of them as if they're the same team. But what I've learned is, no, these are all different teams. And just because you tell the whole story to everyone, each team only got the part that they heard from you. And they go back and they put it in the electronic records, just that segment. And so that was very, that was a very hard lesson to learn because apparently psych came in looking like doctors, but they're not, they're not, they're not. And when they come in and they pretend as if they can't, they're going to run tests and all this, they don't mean medical tests. And so as a parent or as a, a, a patient, it's very important to say, actually to kind of learn the biology and physiology of what I've discovered so that you can basically tell them what you want done. Because we get sucked into all these side notes and comments. And that's another thing I highly recommend is everyone getting a legal copy, legal medical record, a full copy of it every time you go somewhere. Just go on and make that a part of it. Go pick it up, read the notes and make the corrections because with these electronic records, they really do follow you everywhere. And so from there, it just got worse. He still had the strep infection. He also had pneumonia infection. Later, I would learn that he had pneumonia back a couple weeks earlier too. He, they gave us Zoloft and sent us to CBT therapy. 
even though he'd had IV antibiotics, which had gotten him better in the hospital. So and as a mom with common sense, I was like, what are you doing? Like, why would you, why would you do that? Why would you give him a psychiatric medication and talk therapy for a strep infection? So he never returned to baseline and things just got worse and worse and worse. And of course, as I'm traveling this path, I'm not really knowing what I know now. So I'm just trying to get through the physician, pediatrician won't give us antibiotics. To, I said, what well, would it be a good idea to prevent strep like they do in rheumatic fever? Give us just give us some antibiotics. No, they're dangerous. Dangerous. And that's this whole new initiative they're trying to spin is that they're dangerous. Because if we take them and we actually get rid of these things, really get rid of them, we won't have these chronic diseases. <laughs> so the bottom line was he got struck again when he was in the eighth grade. I mean, there's a lot, but so that we can get onto the conversation, there's he got struck in the eighth grade and he ended up, you know, getting in some trouble at school. And so Everybody was threatening him with juvenile detention. And juvenile detention is something you never want your child to see, experience, attend, run for your life. Because even though they tell you that there are services there to help kids and all that, they're, they're absolutely not. So we were thinking the judge would order the test and help get antibiotics. But he ends up getting sucked into this horribly evil, evil, evil system. With foster care, DCS, juvenile courts, that whole thing is just awful. And being put in solitary confinement for five weeks and on top of the pandas now has PTSD. So needless to say, the next years were horrendous and we were very fortunate to be alive. But it was during this time that I just kept going to doctor after doctor. And I was like, this makes no sense. It was an onset, immediate onset. This didn't slowly come on. I mean... And so at the end of the day, I went on, out on my own and I got a doctor that ran like 35 vials of blood and put them in a notebook. And I just sat there, and looked up every single word, made all these notes. It took me way longer than probably it would have taken a doctor. But come to find out the only thing unusual about his blood work was he had a mycoplasma infection. Now, at the time, I didn't even take that much of a note because that's just like a walking pneumonia and he wasn't coughing or anything. So I moved on from that for the next few months and went on to an immunologist and had his immune system double checked. I went and had $10,000 genetics test. He had no genetic abnormalities that would indicate anything of this nature. He had no psychiatric genetics. <laughs> I was like, how does he have 27 diagnoses then? He doesn't even have the genes for this. And so I started doing my own rule outs and I was like, okay, check, check, check. It's not that, it's not that, it's not that. Then I noticed that my two adopted children started getting some symptoms, some, some psychiatric symptoms. Well, they, that what they say are psychiatric symptoms, like just kind of out of the blue. And then I started to notice the correlation with a boil behind her ear when she was slamming the doors and being defiant. And I went and I said, can we have antibiotics for the boil? And the, and the boil behind her went down and she became nice again. And so I just started putting these things together on my own. And I said, okay, this is not normal. We all know that. So I'm going to have to think outside the box. And for some reason, somehow, some way, the only thing left is this mycoplasma. That's the only thing there is left. And I started even thinking, well, what are autoimmune diseases anyway? If he has a perfectly healthy immune system, like, you know, our immune system is basically IgM antibodies, like your innate, your adaptive immune response. If there's nothing wrong with any of that, then what is an autoimmune disease anyway? And I just started thinking about it. And I, I found this paper by uh, Keith Waits out of at UAB, written in 2004. And I started reading about the fact that there are these intracellular infections and these P1 adhesion proteins and on and on and on and on. And of course, I can't read them nearly as fast as someone that's been doing this forever, but I get through them enough to understand that once an infection or a bacteria adheres to our own cell wall, then the immune system recognizes that bacteria is foreign and starts to create antibodies. But unfortunately, as this organism is infiltrating, if you will, our host cell, it takes about three hours to infect a cell. So it kind of, I always say it's like those 
green frogs that stick to the glass. It's like stuck there for, you know, several hours until it gets inside. And because the proteins on our own cell wall and also because of the proteins on the organism, our antibodies are being created against to fight the proteins of the organism and also the proteins of our own host cell wall. So it's like this combination. And it's very, I mean, I started to grasp it. And then I thought, okay, so I get that. So every time that, you know, we get this infection or whatever, it's going to not only attack this organism, but it's also going to attack our own tissues. But I still couldn't understand, like, why he wasn't coughing or seeming like I had had any kind of pneumonia. So I call over to this researcher at Vanderbilt because I've by this time I've worn all the doctors out. They know me. There's all kinds of probably red flags or whatever. I don't care. <laughs> so I'm like, they don't know me in the research department. So I call over there and I asked to talk to Dr. Stratton. Well, I asked to talk to the researcher working on intracellular infections and he picks up the phone. And that's when you know that it's like, for me, it's kind of a God formation that he answered right then. And I said, okay, so I'm looking into some intracellular infections and organisms. And I see that you are researching chlamydia pneumonia, which everybody's like, chlamydia? Like, no, this is a chlamydia pneumonia or pneumonia. And it's different. It's, I mean, it's same, same, but different. And so he says, well, the only person, so I ask him, start asking about mycoplasma. He's like, the only person in this whole country, which when he said that, I was like, that's so weird that researches that organism is Dr. Nicholson, Dr. Garth Nicholson. And I thought, why? Why is there only one person in this whole country researching this organism? And so I tracked this Dr. Nicholson down and I immediately recognized his work because when I went to real school back in, you know, 30 years ago, it was very, very difficult. We had textbooks, like textbooks. I mean, the classes were very hard. The tests were very, you know, anyway, that was the time when Dr. Nicholson had just recently discovered the phospholipid nature of the cell membrane. And so I recognized his name. I don't know how. I was like, what? Like, I don't know. I just remembered. So I did immediately see him as credible source. And I started reading all of his work. And like literally cried for three days as I came to understand that we'd all been exposed to this man-made organism. And now it's not as hard to believe after COVID, you know, but for a time there before COVID, it was a little bit harder to tell a story. But back in the 80s, the Department of Defense, the United States Army Pathology Lab, can't remember who else, a couple of other organizations worked together. Oh, the Texas prison system. And by the way, now I do believe that was like a private prison, got together and decided to test a bioweapon. And so they created this organism, mycoplasma. It has one strain has an HHV6 splice into the genome of the mycoplasma. Another one has EBV and another one has HIV. So the bottom line is they tested the HHV6, or so I read, in the Day Lily Project by Garth Nicholson, in the Texas prison systems, they tested that one on death row inmates. But of course, it didn't stay contained. They tested the chronic fatigue one, EBV, in the Gulf War. Some Persian, I don't know much about the military, but <laughs> those people came back and that was the Gulf War syndrome, apparently, and infected their wives and had the kids with autism. And the prison system ones that got infected, that was a different strain. And so they end up kind of going crazy, if you will. I think luckily, and I don't know if crazy is the word or not, but being really hyped, wired, like more toward the symptoms of insomnia and anxiety. I think that's the one we had. Thankfully, I didn't get the sleepy one. <laughs> I never figured it out. But the bottom line was I made the connection because in 2003, we'd had my ex-brother-in-law, who's since passed, come stay with us after he got out of a rehabilitation center down it in the Texas prison systems. And I immediately, of course, when I put it all together, called him and I talked to him because when he had moved in with us in 2003, our entire family had gotten deathly sick. Like the way they described COVID, that's how we got then. And we got all these boils on us, which apparently were MRSA, but nobody knew what to do about. And so then just slowly over the years, we'd all gotten some chronic disease. I had complex re regional pain syndrome. My son has this autoimmune encephalitis. My ex-husband, I believe he had 
chronic fatigue, maybe some fibromyalgia. But, you know, in the end, putting it all together, the fortunate thing was it ends up being the same route and the same treatment. And so while the treatment was very difficult to get through, we all got through it and it seems like we are doing pretty well now. Now, my son has the PTSD. And so, you know, that that is real. That's from trauma. Antibiotics won't handle that. And so he can't really, you know, putting a child in isolation for five weeks at that age is just unimaginable. So he'll probably always struggle with that. And we have to make sure he doesn't catch strut. But other than that, we're in a much, much better place. Perhaps you are supplementing with magnesium right now. Maybe you're doing a glycinate or a malate. Or if you are wanting to get your bowels moving, maybe an oxide or a citrate. Magnesium is absolutely essential. It's needed for both glycolysis and the citric acid cycle, aka making energy. It's needed for 500 different enzyme reactions. And you've probably heard this and thought, I need magnesium. And you'd probably be right. But where a lot of us fall short is the magnesium that we're choosing. I've seen magnesium levels completely regulate by taking a well-rounded magnesium supplement. What I mean by that is a bunch of different forms of magnesium in all one supplement. And that's why I really love by Optimizer's Magnesium Breakthrough. This stuff is awesome. I pull a ton of hair tissue mineral analysis assessments month by month by month. And by far, just about everyone has a magnesium loss or absolute depletion pattern in their hair tissue mineral analysis. And I've used all sorts of magnesiums from creams to Epsom salts, magnesium salts, down to the malates and the glycinates. And I've really settled on the magnesium breakthrough by Bi Optimizers. So if you are looking for a well-rounded magnesium supplement that will help to calm your mind, help you fall asleep, stay asleep, wake up refreshed, look no further than Bi Optimizers. If you go to magbreakthrough.com slash Keto diet. That's M A G B R E A K T H R O U G H dot com slash keto diet and use the code keto diet 10 all in caps. You'll get 10% off their magnesium breakthrough. Wow. There's so many questions that I have. And just I want to take a moment to just, it's just incredible that you didn't stop seeking for answers. And one thing you mentioned kind of at the beginning there was like how to manage medical teams. Do you have any advice for parents or maybe just people that are in the medical system right now? What pieces you've learned, what questions to ask, any pieces of advice for people that are struggling through these things and their gut, like your, it sounds like your gut was like, there's something else up here. What this, what we're doing isn't working. So if there are people listening that are maybe struggling through those thoughts, what advice do you have for them? I mean, first I will say if someone else, it doesn't matter what kind of degrees they have, is treating you less than or talking down to you, insulting you, insinuating that you are the problem, bounce. Get out of there. Just get out. Fire them. Get to somebody that will listen to you I mean, and I, I've got a couple doctors that I work with now. One we'll see on Zoom. I mean, just somebody that's kind because the last thing we need when we're sick and not feeling well is somebody, you know, just criticizing and acting like we're crazy. You don't need that. If you're not in that situation and there's somebody that wants to help you, then you unfortunately, but I mean, it, it's honestly very interesting. You, you have to kind of learn it to advocate for yourself just enough to take them the protocol and offer, you know, a suggestion like, well, could we look for X, Y, and Z? And can you write me an order for this, this, and this? And then if you find it, you know, and then, and then you get into like that whole strategic communication thing where you're kind of leading someone and, you know, we shouldn't have to do that. So if you're doing, if you have to do that and you want to do that, then we can show you how to do that. If you don't want to do that, just switch doctors and the one thing is just navigating it all in terms of what is the agenda. And that's just so sad that we even as just American citizens trying to do the right thing have to even think this way. But what university is it? What research plant program are they working on as we speak? Like, 
who who's the new you know department chair it's like that we shouldn't have to care about those things but unfortunately it is it is a thing so i just say yep three things if you're not being treated right go somewhere else if you think you have a chance let us know and we'll give you like a list of what to ask for and kind of walk you through it and do some coaching and then third just if you don't know just better be safe than sorry and bounce <laughs> Great advice. I love it. And you mentioned autoimmunity and all of this and kind of a summary. I just want to kind of delve deep into this piece. Are you saying that in your experience and the research that you've done that all autoimmune conditions have roots in co-infections? Is that kind of what I heard you say? And could you elaborate a little bit on that if I'm wrong? Well, here's the thing is yes and no. Yes. I believe, I believe that all of them that I've seen have been traced back to intracellular infections, you know, and, and it's not just bacteria either. I mean, the herpes viruses lie dormant in your neurons and then can be reactivated, you know, upon a co-infection coming into the body. And so, because you're already a little bit immunocompromised, you can't fight off the molds, the different kinds of foods that everybody puts in the category as allergens or all these things actually really are just making the bacteria angry. In, in most cases, I believe. And so it's understanding, and this does get a little heavy scientifically, but it's not really that hard to understand because if you have like something in your cells, like let's just say it's colonized in your kidneys or your liver or whatever, or your lungs, and then you have another infection that comes into your body, like the flu or whatever, these bacteria are going to be afraid of this virus. Let's say, for instance, the virus is more pathogenic. And they're going to flee or try to get away from it. So they burrow down deeper and we get flare-ups. So this flare-up could last like as long as this infection does. Well, actually, as long as the antibody response is. So it's important to notice the IgG responses to the infections, not necessarily just the active infections. But yeah, clearing the molds and cutting the different things out of the diet are important. It doesn't really necessarily eliminate the root. And so I I do love the keto diet because, and it was so interesting because I was thinking, wow, this is great that this is something that you're focused on because these organisms that I focus on are missing a pathway in their metabolic cycle. They're like missing, see, so you've got glycolysis, then you've got the electron transport system, and they get the Krebs cycle. That was in the wrong order, but they cannot metabolize protein. They can only metabolize the simple sugars. So when we are eating a lot of sugar, eating those simple sugars, they're having a feeding frenzy. So when you cut that out, people do end up feeling a lot better. And I know there's a period of time where they feel kind of blah. And I was always taught or trained that that's switching over from the pathway of breaking down protein over into just you know, switching metabolic pathways in terms of metabolism. But I now am starting to think that it might be a response to the dying off of the organisms, which can cause a really bad, you know, physical symptoms, really, really bad ones. So it could be that too. I just think that's great that that's what you're focusing on because that's very, very helpful in eliminating these organisms. Yeah, I agree with you completely. I've seen when individuals have these co-infections and dormant viruses, bacteria, and we get them on the ketogenic diet, we have to understand too what the ketogenic diet is doing is really, like you said, switching metabolic pathways, learning how to use ketones as energy, also learning how to use fat as energy. Those fa That fat can be coming from cells. The cells have the infections. And so I agree with you. Oftentimes, I think it is that diet dying off experience as we are activating or rather accessing stores that we haven't in, in some time. Where do you, and do you feel like biofilms have a role in any of this? Because we do know that bacteria, parasites, those sorts of things will start to develop these, I think of them like brick walls around them where the immune system can't even necessarily see what's going on. They're able to build these whole colonies do you have any experience with biofilms as it relates to these autoimmune conditions and these root causes at all? Excellent question. And I'm so glad you brought that up. There's just so much in all this that it's hard to remember like, okay, yes, definitely, yeah. absolutely, 
biofilms are a thing. You know, these organisms sometimes will create like a protein matrix and kind of like a blanket over their colonies to prevent, you know, antibiotics or anything from getting to them. And you definitely have to use like something to break that down. We have a bio disrupt we use in our line. And so sometimes some people don't want to go the, you know, Western medicine route. And so we'll scan them and we'll use a Zytal scanner and use nutraceuticals. But absolutely. And if I can't get something to clear, and, and typically a lot of this psychiatric is autoimmune in my belief. And a lot of times that'll be up behind the sinuses. So I do deal with that a lot. Mm-hmm, absolutely. And, and you know, it's also important to note, like if you've got this nasopharyngeal region, like behind your sinuses, and you can get... And, Cellular, intracellular infections like mycoplasma, whatever. Chlamydia pneumonia is typically a little bit lower, but you can also, streptococcus pneumonia can also invade your cells. So it's possible and sometimes likely in these more complex cases that there's multiple organisms inside of the cell competing for, you know, the cellular, our cellular machinery. And I'm like, get out of our cells. You know, just get out of our cells. And the thing is, is that when they infected those prisoners, In Texas, see, I can just see it now, this microbiologist chatting it up with this attorney general and him trying to explain to him that we don't want to do this. And the general's like not knowing anything about microbiology. We got to do it. Just do it and executing it. But what happened is when you infect someone with the mycoplasma fermentans was the original organism. It's not airborne. It's found in the soil. So let's just say they genetically modified that one to make it heat resistant. And antibi- they made it antibiotic resistant. So all this crap about that is just that. Then they splice these viruses into it and they infect these prisoners. But if you take a step back and think, wait a minute, mycoplasma fermentins and mycoplasma pneumoniae, you can have genetic transference between those two organisms in terms of pathogenicity. So now all of a sudden we've got this airborne organism that is weaponized. And then you can have genetic transference between mycoplasma pneumonia and streptococcus pneumonia. And so now all of a sudden, everything in our our sinus cavity is weaponized. So now we're all just walking around with weaponized, resistant, virus-laden bacteria in our bodies. And it's, it's just a mess. It's a mess. And it's very sad. It's quite sad. I think I was very upset for about a year or two, and I was just like, I don't even know what to do, you know? So I just do this. I wrote a book, try to help as many people as I can and and spread the word. Yeah, that's all you can do. And when we're talking about sinus, just because maybe there are individuals that are thinking, okay, so could I just use a neti pot or a navage? Could I add the biofilm disruptors to that? Binders? Like, can we address it directly at the source in addition to protocols to address the rest of the things? But would that be a targeted thing to do? Or is that a silly question? No, that's a great question. And yes, that that's amazing. I mean, because like a neti pot is wonderful, you know, and here's the thing is it's always a matter of the, the doing the consultation and the severity of the symptoms. And while I'm not a doctor, I'll kind of do all the pre stuff for Dr. Oaks. Talk about, you know, I mean, like how much is this disrupting your daily life? And so that's the determination of what depth are we going to go to with, with the treatment plan? So you can use for something that's a little milder, but still annoying. You can definitely go the route you mentioned. Somebody that's really struggling. And, and, you know, a lot of times people will have the sinus stuff and not realize that it's uh, directly correlated to the psychiatric stuff. So when that's the case, then I, yeah. And then you have to look at what are the psych symptoms because the die-off is going to make them worse. And so, it, it, I mean, it's, it's a difficult problem to, to treat, actually. Yeah, and it's definitely a worse before it gets better <laughs> in a lot yeah, of ways. Yeah, definitely a worse before it gets better. Yeah, but, you know, you can sometimes get people balanced out with nutraceuticals and then pulse dose, which is which is great. That is really doesn't interrupt as much. So there's really all kinds of ways to do it. And so it's just like, okay, what do you want as patient or client? You know, what can your life tolerate? And then kind of matching that up. So, yep, that's excellent. Yes. And that goes back to the piece on finding a practitioner. I use pulse dosing a ton in my practice. Usually uh, my rule is the more co-infections you have, the more sensitive you are and the slower we need to go. That's kind of just like how it ends up being with the clients that I work with. And I agree with you, pulse dose, titration, like 
understanding that there's this up in this flow that needs to happen. I couldn't agree with you more. And I agree with you on targeting. I, I super love the Navage for this because it's way cleaner of a system than the neti pot where there's liquid everywhere, especially if you're adding binders and things. The Navage keeps everything much cleaner. We've talked a little bit about autoimmunity and just kind of those root causes underneath. There are many people that I've connected with that have these undiagnosed autoimmune conditions that their doctor says, it's some sort of autoimmune. I I don't know what it is. So come back to me when it gets worse. The people listening that have this sort of undiagnosed autoimmune situation? Is it the same sort of thoughts that they should be thinking when they're listening to this episode? Yes. I mean, do it now. I mean, it's like the the wait until it gets worse is like, okay, it needs to colonize several other organs and 30% more of your tissue. Then you'll be sick enough for me to start calling you psychiatrically unwell. No, no, grab the bull by the horns. Do it sooner than later because, I mean, I honestly, I'm a different breed of person. I don't know how. I've just always been this way, but I have to see for myself, I guess scientists. So I went back to medical school because I just couldn't believe that this was how it was now. Because when I went, it was totally different. And I went to school at Liberty, like for a master's in molecular medicine. And I took two classes. The first one was the, it was supposed to be a remedial class, like biochem, genetics, blah, blah, blah. And I was really excited about it because I really love learning those pathways and I get my book and it's the biochemistry of someone with cancer. So everything is completely backwards. It's basically training students on oncogenes and upside down science to where it's like, are you kidding me right now? Like I spent twice as long. The class almost killed me because I'd have to learn because like, oh, I'm going to get an A. (laughs) I'd have to learn the wrong way or the way they were teaching it. And then I'd go back and review what I knew to be right because I didn't want to get off of my head. And at the end of each chapter, it was all it was about drugs. And you could develop this. You could develop this. It was like planting ideas into these people's heads of what they needed to develop next. And I'm like, you guys can completely taken away the freedom of entrepreneurship or invention or the thought process for people that might have a different idea because it's like, then the tests are nothing but what to use. But, well, we could use something else because the thing I found the most interesting was that, you know, cancer, well, I, and I, I was like, oh my gosh, I don't want to know that this might cause cancer. I don't want to know that. (laughs) But cancer is the result of a wounding internal environment that they don't know the cause of. And I just like lean back in my chair, roll my eyes. Of course you don't. But instead of focusing on that piece Of course, they diverge into the circulatory system and the fact that it's like now a blood supply surrounds the tumor. So completely skipping over the fact that it is most likely, you know, untreated. So my point is that even though you might have a not otherwise specified autoimmune condition that might be confusing, they might not be able to put a name to it. If you don't jump in and take care of it now, you know, it could end up becoming cancer, you know, or something much worse before you even get the first diagnosis. So I would not wait. Whether you're keto, low-carb, paleo, or somewhere in between, electrolytes facilitate hundreds of functions in the body, including the conduction of nerve impulses, hormonal regulation, nutrient absorption, and fluid balance. This is amplified on the ketogenic diet, but every human requires this balance. When you have adrenal hypo or hyperfunction, this affects your body's sodium-potassium balance. If you get headaches behind your left eye, that's a good sign you need sodium. If you get headaches behind your right eye, that's That's a good sign that you need potassium. I cannot tell you how many of my one-on-one clients come to me with an imbalance in electrolytes in some way, whether that be displaying in headaches, muscle cramps, fatigue, sleepiness, or seen right there in their blood work or their hair tissue mineral analysis. Much of this is improved with proper electrolyte supplementation. Now, I consume a lot of packets a day. There are days where I'll have three or four packets of Element a day, but I definitely always, always have at least one. And not just any type of electrolyte packets, it has to be Element because there's no sugar, there's no fillers, there's no color, there's no artificial anything. It is crazy what other electrolyte brands will put in their packets. No thank you. 
Now, what I really, really ultra love about Element is the balance of electrolytes. They have 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, and 60 milligrams of magnesium. Now, right now, Element is offering my listeners a free sample pack with any order. That's eight single-serving packets totally free with an Element order. This is a great way to try all eight flavors or share Element with a salty friend. Get yours by going to drinklmnt.com slash KDP. This deal is only available through my link. You must go to drinklmnt.com slash KDP. An Element offers a no questions asked refund. So if you don't like it, contact them and get your money back. No questions asked. I got to say, walking into my friend's house or jumping into a friend's car and seeing their Element packets on the floor or in a little container on their counter is literally the best feeling. The fact that I get to share this product with you guys and you get to love it as much as I do is such a gift. Again, if you go to drinklmnt.com slash KDP, you can get your free sample pack with any order. And so you mentioned, you just touched on mold a tiny bit. I, I want to spend the rest of our time together kind of understanding the process at which one would maybe address these things, just kind of understanding that cells are the smallest thing, right? Parasites would be much larger in most cases. Mycotoxins are larger than bacteria and viruses, metals and chemicals. Eh, chemicals can be differing in actual physical size, do you see that there is a benefit to a clear order of operations where you start with, if somebody is coming to you with autoimmune conditions and they have symptoms of parasites, would you treat those parasites first before you get into some of these co-infections that are actually physically smaller? Or kind of what are you looking at in regards to an order of operations when addressing these conditions? Well, I look at what's causing the client the most problem that day because usually they come in and things are really off or or maybe not, and that's good too. But in terms of the parasites, I find that a lot of practitioners tend to, that's their go-to initially. But I also know that the mycoplasma and the intracellular organisms and even the spirochetes, I mean, they act as parasites. So it's like you're almost looking at parasitic bacteria with the properties of a virus because it, you know, overtakes the host cell machinery. So I'm like, take a step back and think, okay, so when the most important thing to understand in order of operations is something called chemotaxis. And another concept is that's very important is that the host, I mean, the mycoplasmas don't have a cell wall. So for instance, like if I live in a house and there's penicillium mold, now even though penicillin is the go-to treatment for group A strep, it does not kill mycoplasma because of the mechanism of action. There's no cell wall. So it is possible that you could have a patient that has strep starting with the penicillin and they actually get worse because the mycoplasma is still thriving. So It's very important to know like the whole terrain before you dive in and the mechanism of the medications. So when you have or are dealing with these organisms, now strep is mostly an extracellular organism. So you want to try to clear the bloodstream as much as you can initially and balance out the cytokine immunomodulation to get the symptoms kind of at bay before you even start going. So first thing is to gather the information on the entire terrain. And then the second one is to balance out the misdirected immune response that's currently taking place. And then you kind of start in step by step. But I always go for the root first because I'm like, here's the thing. The root is what's making everything else so problematic. Most people can live, or a lot of people can live in a house with penicillium mold with no problem. But a patient that is struggling with the these intracellular organisms at a certain level are going to have a huge problem with it. So would you go in and treat that mold? I would not. I would go in for the root and start bringing that down, knowing that penicillin mold is not really going to hurt anybody. That's like a, a antibiotic, you know? And very rarely will you come across black mold. In the case where I, if somebody thinks and they're convinced that they have black mold, you can get a polymerase chain reaction mold testing kit or have a company come in. B- 
because I've just seen a lot of people get distracted on that pathway and spend, I mean, $100,000 ripping things out and ripping things up. And then they're just sick again in a year or like a short period of time because they still have the root. So that's my order of operation. Go in, we get all the lab work, you know, and there's kind of a standard protocol. We look for five or six things that are in most of these autoimmune diseases and then start that treatment. And then, you know, then start looking at the minerals and the vitamin levels. Because a lot of times if these organisms are parasitizing those things, like I know for my son, I, I was just dead set on the fact that, wait a minute, if this was the offender and it's using all these vitamins and messing everything up, then then getting rid of it, everything else should balance out on its own per homeostasis. And that's your body's own way of kind of balancing things out. And it would do it kind of at the right time as it could be tolerated. So for us, is vitamin D was like non-existent. I mean, it's all kinds of things off. We didn't do, I did nothing else other than just focus on the root and everything else balanced out. You know, but Dr. Nicholson, you know, says, go ahead and if somebody's feeling really bad, supplement with the minerals and the vitamins as needed. So that piece is kind of an, you know, just an opinion on based on the client and their situation. So yeah, definitely spend the time. I mean, I go all the way back to their childhood. Like, because what I found is, unfortunately, a lot of people are born through a birth canal where the gynecologist at the time or whatever did not screen for things that could have been passed on to the child. So I'm of the belief now that a lot of this stuff may not be genetic in terms of how we think of genetic or how I do, like a four-leaf clover, but yet epigenetics. So Just because you picked up something from your mother or father and it incorporated itself into your own cells, it doesn't mean that you can't reverse it. So I think that's where the conundrum lies in the terms of the marketing from these companies telling us that we're doomed forever because we have this gene. When in fact, I noticed that a lot of times these genes, you know, belong to these organisms. And I'm just like, shaking my head. So yeah, figuring out the terrain with a very in-depth conversation, infections when they were little, hospitalizations, and not from the normal sense of how they've always been screened, but like diseases from both sides of their parents. I'll do like their family tree. Like usually they'll write out their family tree, like mom and diseases, dad and disease. You can see kind of, and in grandparents on both sides, you can kind of see what's in the downline. Like a lot of times, you know, juvenile type one diabetes, a virus. I mean, and once you made those connections, you can kind of see even before you scan or run blood work or do anything else, what you're probably dealing with, you know, and then start treating the root. And then like you have mentioned, well, before you treat the root, kind of modulate the cytokine reaction that's off, then start going for the root and then start working on the netty po- and, and add to that. It's just, as you know, it's difficult to get them through this first three months of what I just said. But that's just the way I do it. And that's not saying that there's not another way to do it better or that there's something I haven't learned yet that I could improve on. That's just the way that I've done it and been, you know, I mean, for instance, this 13-year-old kid, he hadn't grown. He was so little and short and he had all these issues and his mom was about to put him in a facility. And I was like, no, 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 no. So I just took over his care for six weeks and just ripped the Band-Aid off pushed him through and with the help of a doctor, of course, and he came off his CPAP, started not needing those depends at night or whatever, stopped went the med. I mean, all these changes got friends. I mean, it was incredible. So it just depends on the situation and how extreme you want to go to get someone. You know what I'm saying? Completely. I do. Completely. I do. Oh my goodness. I could chat with you for forever about all these things. I still have so many questions, but we're going to have to save it for another time. Where can people learn more from you? I know that you have a book that you mentioned a little bit. Where can people get that book? All those important questions. To yeah, absolutely. What's wrong with my child.com. I would definitely start by reading that. I had an editor because my book was so sciencey, and they were like, no. So, I mean, she's cut it down. It's an easy read. It makes the concepts easy to understand. I would breeze through that book first just to get an overall, because it's a new concept for most people, just to kind of get the concept in mind and then reach out. You can contact us through that site. 
And then I'll set, do the pre-consultation and then set you up with our doctor, get blood work done. And we can see patients remotely for up to a year or whatever. I think that's the rule, but we'll go over all that. So there is health, there is hope, there is another side to this. And like you said, it's just, you know, getting the word out there. So I'm really grateful that this is what you're doing, Liam, because I always tell people in light of all else, if you don't want to do any of this, cut sugar completely, learn the keto diet. So what you're doing is, you know, such a gift. I love it. Elizabeth, thank you so much for coming on the show today and sharing everything with us. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thanks for having me and you have a great rest of your day. I hope you really enjoyed our time with Elizabeth. You can grab her book on Amazon. It's called What's Wrong With My Child. And thanks for hanging out with us today. I hope you enjoyed our time with Elizabeth. You can grab her book called What's Wrong With My Child by Elizabeth Harris on Amazon. And we will see you back here for another episode next week. Okay, bye. Thanks for listening. Join us next Tuesday for another episode of the Keto Diet Podcast. Looking for more resources? Go to healthfulpursuit.com for keto meal plans, weight loss programs, low-carb recipes, and oodles of free resources to get you going. The Keto Diet Podcast, including show notes and links, provides information in respect to healthy living, recipes, nutrition, and diet, and is intended for informational purposes only. The information provided is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, nor is it to be construed as such. We cannot guarantee that the information provided on the Keto Diet Podcast reflects the most up-to-date medical research. Information is provided without any representation or warranties of any kind. Please consult a qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding your health and nutrition program. 